a snake -like robot. Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us here on the fourth day of our RoboSports Network Spring Conferences presented by WPI. I'm your host, Francis O'Rourke. Joining me now for our final presentation of this Friday is Sean Lavery, and he's going to talk about Drivetrains 201, Gear Ratio, and Motor Optimization. I'm really excited to hear this. Sean, thank you for being here. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, thanks for having me. Um, it's an honor to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm the lead mentor now in my second year as lead mentor and more than 10 years as a mentor at Team 1712. Um, and before that, I was a student for five years on Team 116 um, in Virginia and now 1712 outside Philadelphia. Um, and really my passion with all of FRC design has always been the drivetrain. Oh. Um, I love me me uh, mechanism design. I love manipulators. I love coding autonomous, but drivetrains kind of the foundation of everything else is built upon. Very cool. All right, so um, th thank you for being here again. A uh, couple things for everybody who's watching. If you have questions as we go through the presentation from Sean, just go ahead and ask those in the chat with exclamation point Q followed by your question. We'll take that, we'll pick it up, we'll save it, and if we like it, we'll ask live your question live on the air. So make sure if you've got anything, send it in. Um, also, I want to thank, of course, WPI for helping to make this possible. WPI, or Worcester Polytechnic Institute, is a uh, leader in project-based learning for higher education especially, and they were the first uh, university to offer not only a bachelor's of science, but also a master's and a PhD in robotics engineering. So if you want to learn more, maybe become a student at WPI, or if you want to uh, sponsor some of the projects that WPI is well known for, you can visit wpi.edu for tons more information. All right, well, with that all said and out of the way, uh, Sean, I turn the floor over to you. Let's uh, let's hear your presentation on Drivetrains 201. All right, thanks. Um, as it mentions in the title, I'm calling it 201 just because there's a lot of other great resources out there on the, the absolute fundamentals of a drivetrain. This is kind of the next step up of how you get more out of your drivetrain to achieve your game objectives. Um, so we already kind of covered who am I, so let's get right past that slide and get into some of the goals and takeaways that I want out of this presentation. Um, what this isn't is this isn't the fundamental math lessons. There are great, some other great courses on that, um, including here on this RSN program um, on how DC motors work, um, how what basic mechanical theory and mechanical advantage is, how to trade speed for torque given a certain power budget. Um, there's not going to be a lot of explicit discussion of swerve or mechanism or omnidirectional drivetrains, but a lot of these principles still can still be applied, even though I ostensibly tailored this towards a, a tank drive um, style drivetrain. Um, there will be a couple equations that get flashed up on screen, but it'll be pretty low level, not super hard to understand. Don't expect a ton of math. What you will get um, is sharing a lot of resources about how what that you can use to design your drivetrain. Um, some poor habits and poor metrics that people use to evaluate the drivetrain and how to avoid using those. Um, and just a general understanding of what can you do to make your drivetrain go from good to great um, in FRC. Um, so in order to do that, I'm going to talk about a handful of different topics here, uh, starting with motor selection, then moving on to sprint distances, traction limiting, a brief discussion on one versus two speed drivetrains. I don't give you an answer of which one is absolutely better. There's still a lot of situational stuff on your own team. Talk about it a little bit. And then just some general tips and once again, go over the resources and we'll have time for some questions and discussion at the end. Um, but there should be plenty of time for that. This is usually about a one hour presentation and we've got a time slot to let it expand. So I might ramble a little bit beyond these topics. So kind of hopping right into the content here. Um, understanding the history of FRC motors is a little bit important now at this point, now that we have so many newer FRC motors. Um, so I originally created this slide, it focused on brushed motors, um, but now we have brushless. And when going back further in FRC history, a lot of the motors used to be motors that were from industry. Um, they're a motor that already existed that we were applying to FRC. Um, and recently in the past, five to 10 years, we started making more and more motors specifically for FRC. Um, so there's kind of three viable brushed motor options for your drivetrain, really just kind of two now um, in the age of brushless, no one's really using the 775 anymore. But kind of tying these points together, the SIM motor is a motor that was a huge deal when it first got introduced to FRC and an even bigger deal when they first started letting us use four of them in 2005. Um, but this is a motor that came from industry. Um, so if you want to go back in FRC history a little bit, it's um, it's been called the SIM for a while now, but it used to be called the CHIP or the Chip, uh, Chihuahua motor because um, the CIM is Chihuahua Industries motor. My team in high school called it the Chalupa because we can say Chihuahua. <laughs> um, 
But I, like, if you go look at old 118 drivetrains, they have the fish and chips drivetrain where it's the four uh, Fisher Price motors and the two chips. You know, um, when I when I was uh, in first in that period of time, we used to call it the Chippewa motor, probably because we misread it at some point. Yeah, or, it's a it's a Chinese company that it's close to Chippewa, but I don't know. Maybe they <laughs> maybe they had an Americanized vendor name too. Yeah. Um, and we also yeah, if you go dig it on CD. You find all sorts of names for it. At, at one point, we used to call it also the Atwood motor. I don't know yeah, why. I do remember that. But that I was. I think that was a different vendor for it. Okay. Um, but moral of the story is this is a motor that was on trailer jacks. Um, oh. And we took that first. Now owns the design for it, but it, it was kind of applied to FRC, and it was a really big step in FRC motors at the time. Um, Francis knows this. Like we used to use the Bosch drill motor was the primary drive motor. Oh uh, yes. We had some, pretty significant biasing between oh, yeah. going clockwise versus counterclockwise. This motor came in with relatively no bias, or at least in comparison to like the Bosch drill motor, there's no biasing in one direction or the other. Um, and it's it was really just a step up in the available wattage and the available amount of load you can put into it before it fries itself. Um, so it very quickly became the standard of FRC drivetrain motors. Um, it's what's known as a sealed motor, um, meaning there's no airflow in or out of the case of the motor. Um, so it relies on thermal mass. It's on just basically it's mass to build up heat and dissipate it um, externally. That's in an opposition to fan-cooled motors, such as the 775 Pro, which have uh, vent ports on the front to pull in air and expel air out vent ports on the back, and they have a fan attached to the rotor, um, which is kind of the... When we're looking at FRC brushed motors, um, that's kind of the hierarchy, or the two dichotomies you look at is the sealed versus the uh, fan-cooled. Um, so the sealed motors, they're just relying on their, their mass to do it versus the fan cooled. So the faster your rotor turns, the faster the fan on the rotor turns, and the more air it expels. So you kind of get this double whammy effect when it goes close to the stall or higher load applications where it's not only it's generating more heat because it has more load on it, but it's also expelling less heat because it's turning slower. Um, so you kind of get this feedback loop almost of things that can cause nasty bad things to happen to a motor. Um, so that's a reason a lot of the sims were viewed as a little bit more bulletproof is you could put them in these high load situations. Um, but in the past handful of years, as more and more FRC specific motors have been designed, you've seen things like the mini sim, which it's ostensibly it's two thirds of a sim, it's two thirds the length, two thirds the power, uh, two thirds the weight. Um, but it was designed specifically by VEX for the first robotics competition. Um, and that included a couple advantages over the, the classic sim um, where the, the full-size sim has a bushing on its output shaft versus the, the biggest one here is the mini sim has a bearing there that's a lower friction, generates less heat, and runs more efficiently. Um, so even though essentially it only has 66% of the power, it does have some efficiency advantages that can give it relatively more power compared to the sim over the course of the match. Um, and then the 775 Pro, also known as the Andy Mark Redline, um, was another FRC-specific 775 design um, that a lot of teams started using in their drivetrains. But this is a fan-cooled motor, so you got to be mindful of the situations you're using it. Um, this was a lot of teams a handful of years ago who were being on the bleeding edge. Um, we're trying to save more weight, save more space in the robots, and go in with these smaller, lighter drive motors. Um, but it's been kind of phased out just by the introduction of brushless motors in the last couple of years. Um, so the first resource I want to share with you guys, and for, for the folks turning into this presentation, a lot of you probably already know about this, but it's motors.vex.com. Um, my screenshot's a little bit outdated here, um, but it's, it's a great resource that has info on how DC motors work, uh, a little bit of info on how brushless motors work, um, but also just a lot of empirical data on all the different motors that are used in FRC or almost all the different motors that are used in FRC. Um, so like the landing splash page you'll get to looks like this, where you have different motors and it lists their free speed, the free current, um, maximum power, stall torque, and stall current. Um, and then you can click on each of those and you get a more detailed page that breaks out a lot more information. Um, and you can download CSVs of this. You can play with it yourself. Um, but it, it gives you, this is the website that I kind of live on for the first two weeks of build season. A lot of times is we're picking out different motors for different applications in our robots, not only drivetrain. Um, and then on these detail pages, you can get the full motor curve. I won't go into a ton of detail on just how to read this. Um, there's some other resources that do that. But basically, it's just a graph. Pay attention to your labels. Um, you can match up different RPMs versus efficiencies versus power loads, et cetera. Um, do be mindful of your axes. Some 
source like Vexilis is uh, their X axis is their speed, but other places might have torque down there. So do pay attention to your labels. Um, but then beyond that, like motor curves forever were available from vendors, but you didn't necessarily trust them because um, it's what the vendor says. So Vex was actually getting empirical data to generate these motor curves, which is a big step up at the time. Um, but they also generated some other tests that you almost never found from vendors, such as the peak power and these locked rotor tests. Um, peak power test um, with a DC motor, it's going to have its highest power output at 50% RPM. So they would bind the shaft to be turning at 50% RPM. They'd load it to that point and measure its power output over time. Um, with the locked rotor test, they'd basically put the motor into a stall condition um, and you can apply different voltages and see how long it ran until it failed, basically. Um, so this gives you a lot of information, especially for mechanism design. How much can you load these motors before things start going poorly? Uh, for drivetrains, hopefully you don't have to hit any locked rotor conditions for too long a period of time, especially if you traction limit your drive. But <laughs> for something like a 775 Pro, you might want to be mindful of that. Uh, so one of the first things I want to compare here is Sims versus Mini Sims using this data that was mined from uh, the motors.vex.com. So this is matching out a single Sim versus a single Mini Sim based on their peak power test, not their locked rotor test, over time. At the beginning of the match, the Mini Sim does have two thirds the power. And this is assuming it's starting from a purely room temperature condition, no load on it previously. But as time goes, you can see these lines converge. Um, this test is a little bit longer than match is three minutes long, but by the three minute mark, they're essentially overlapping. So you can see those efficiency advantages really start to add up for the mini sim. And a lot of teams will typically operate mini sims. They'll do six mini sims in place of four sims. So you get the same total power at the beginning of the match, but you get a lot better total power at the ends of matches. Granted, this is a peak power test. This is worse conditions typically than you're going to see during an FRC match. Um, you're not running 100% power 100% of the time. Usually, um, maybe if you run into a wall or something, bad things can happen. But the other thing to keep in mind is you're also starting from an ideal condition. So this less heat buildup of having the more efficient motor that performs relatively stable over time can be really important in the playoffs where you're playing matches six minutes apart. You don't necessarily have the time to fully cool your motors off to room temperature between matches. They're starting somewhere down this curve because they're starting in a preloaded kind of configuration. Um, so that was the reason for, at least until the last couple of years when we started seeing teams swap over to the brushless motors, a lot of teams have been favoring the mini sims over the sims, my team included, um, basically on all our robots for the, like, the last three years up until this year when we switched to the Neos, we had been using mini sims and been very happy with them. Yeah, I was I was going to push really hard to get my team to swap over to a, a six mini sim drive uh, until the day, literally the day the Falcons came out, and when, which kind of blew everything out of the water. Yeah, we'll be getting into a lot of brushless motor talk in a second here, but yeah. a lot of teams had to reevaluate. Like, that's the one problem we've had with this presentation is it's outdated almost every year when something new comes out and changes the game. Yep. Um, maybe we'll have two years of stability because we had the odd things happening this year. Yeah. Um, but it'll be, it, it's it's an arms race now. But for a while, it had kind of stabilized and then four sims of what everyone's using. Now it's something new every year. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of almost miss the days where we just could assume we had four sims and kind of move on with our lives. But I, yeah, you, you I, I didn't do have to make decisions. <laughs> yes, I, I do like innovation, which is good. It's just you know I got to think now. It's thick and hard, but it's fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, this slide I used to talk a lot more about the seven seven five peak power test. Now that many fewer teams are using seven seven fives in your drive, it's not as important to stress. Um, but this is showing the peak power, not the locked rotor test. If a 775 is running at 12 volt peak power, it will fail in less than two minutes, less than the length of one match um, per the vendor's data. Granted, if you have multiple of them in the drive, um, your, your voltage sag will prevent them from all running at 12 volts. And there's a lot of controls and implementations you can do that I'll talk about in a little bit to limit current and limit voltage to try to avoid these kind of failure conditions. But if you're, this kind of applies to any time you're going on the bleeding edge with a new motor, especially if you're trying to reduce weights with a lighter motor. Um, or a motor that isn't proven to endure high load conditions. Um, you, you're going to want to be mindful of it, and you're going to want to limit your current and your voltage applied to them to make sure you don't blow them up, because the worst thing that can happen to your drive is if you stop driving in the match. Yep. It's so now kind of moving into what's happened in the last couple of years, the brushless revolution, so to speak. Um, it's completely changing the FRC landscape for drivetrains, just like it changed the landscape for motors in all sorts of other hobbies. Um, 
so brushless motors have a lot better power density um, and in theory less mechanical wear than brushed motors just because there's physically fewer parts that are rubbing against one another um, you don't have the commutator and the brushes making physical contact the same way and but in practice sometimes there's going to be teething issues and other lifespan and loading issues that can apply before the mechanical loading uh, would come into play um, but the superior power density you can get a lot more power out of a smaller package weight and space wise you can see it in kind of the bottom of the screen comparing this image i stole from vex i can run the sim to the mini sim to the falcon the falcon with its speed controller is the size of a mini sim and it provides a lot more power than any of them um, these kind of motors have used are used in a lot of other hobbies particularly hobbies that have high speed relatively low load applications um, particularly in low startup load applications um, so things like rc airplanes um, where it's there's not a whole lot of startup load it gets up to speed before that load kicks in um, but the the downside to these with the way they work is they're basically three phase ac motors almost um, they're they're using a lot of the same operating principles but they're operating off of direct current um, whereas you can kind of see in this gif as the magnets this is an outrunner in the gif as the magnets turn around the coils, you're energizing different coils to keep attracting and pushing them around in the circle. Um, so in order to do this, your controller needs to know the position of your rotor um, and it, relative to the coils. Uh, there are sensorless brushless motors, but they're not used in FRC, and they have a lot of startup torque issues um, because it doesn't know its position of its rotor. Um, all the ones that are used in FRC currently, both the, the Falcon, the Neo, the Neo 550, and even the dynamic motor uh, all have integrated encoders that are you have to plug into the speed controller in order for them to function. Um, in the case of the Neo, it's a Hall effect sensor. I don't actually know off the top of my head what's used in the Falcon. Um, but sometimes these sensors can be useful in other places in your drive frame too. They can export the data. It just depends on what your application is, if you want to have an additional encoder beyond what's built into the motor or not. Um, but it does provide an additional failure point, particularly in the, uh, the cable that runs between the encoder on the motor and your controller. So getting to some of the data for brushless motors, um, you got to be mindful of your axes here. You got to be mindful of what's displayed. You got to be mindful of what data is and isn't included in these data sets. Uh, the way they that Vex does their empirical testing for brushed motors for like the locked rotor and the peak power is they hook it up to a DC power supply running at that voltage. They don't necessarily have voltage protection in line there. They do that until it fails. But the way that a brushless motor works, you can't do that. There needs to be that controller in line. And they're, so they're effectively testing the motor and the controller rather than just the motor. And a lot of those speed controllers have protections built in that make some of these tests not viable because they have these current loads. They have these temperature detections and other things in there that can prevent them from doing some of these failure tests. Um, so do review what data is and isn't presented in making decisions. Um, and also remember how much current you have available. So if you're looking at that motor curve for that Falcon, you see that its peak power is 783 watts. We're talking about a one horsepower motor. That's incredible. That blows the doors off anything else in FRC. Wow. But it's only getting one horsepower when it's operating at, I think that's about 800 watts. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're, or sorry, we're, or um, 800 watts, obviously. But it, the current wise, if you're looking there, it's it's astronomical. It's a, almost yeah. 100 amps. Yeah, I think I think Ken mentioned it was like 100. And, it, by the way, Ken Stafford did a presentation going much more in depth into the data, which I know you're 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 not focusing on on purpose. Um, but I think that was like 150 amps or something, enough to blow the main breaker. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. It's it's up there at, yeah, it, it's challenging your main breaker. <laughs> um, and you, yeah, if you guys have any more questions on this, definitely check out Ken's presentation. It's one of the resources I mentioned later in my thing, right? He's covering other resources, but he obviously did part of this week. Um, so definitely go check out that video if you haven't already. Yeah. Um, fortunately, Vex does, they realize that we're not drawing 100 amps on our motor when we have a 120 amp breaker. Um, so they gave us this nice little table as part of their advertising for the Falcon 500 that showed different efficiencies at 40 amps, which is obviously tuned for your 40 amp breakers you put in your power distribution panel. Um, so you get a better idea, like you're getting 400 watts at 40 amps. That's still a lot of power. It's just not 783 watts. Um, so going down to the next slide here, I'm looking at some SIM versus Neo locked rotor tests because Rev does provide some of that data. Um, and the last time I really truly updated this presentation was right before the season started. So we didn't necessarily have all this data for the, the Falcon at the time. 
Um, you got to be mindful again, as I mentioned, to look at the axes and whatnot. So these two charts, if you lay them right on top of each other, like I do on the slide, it looks like that bottom one for the Neo, it's failing much, much later. But that Neo scale is only running out to about 160 seconds, as opposed to the lock rotor st stall touch for the SIM is running out to 350 seconds. So if you actually overlap them with the axes bound the same, you, you see pretty similar performances there. Um, and also remember, as I mentioned previously, the tests for the brushless motors are performed with the controllers in line, as opposed to just the DC power supply for the for the brush motors. Um, unlimited loading, you'll see failure conditions on both a SIM and a Neo, um, but you're not going to get into those scenarios, hopefully, in a, in a real match. Um, ultimately, you're going to need some empirical data. Talk to teams who have used these motors to see if they've had failures. Uh, we used Neos this year. We only competed once. Um, we didn't have any failures in that time. Of the teams I talked to last year using Neos, I didn't hear a whole lot of failures. I heard of a couple different things here and there, um, particularly with like the wires coming undone or something like that, but not too many. I haven't heard of too many cases of people smoking Neos, for instance. Um, so do be mindful of the test conditions. Do try to get some real world data when you're evaluating this. And it's also going to be up to your team how much you want to be on the bleeding edge, how much risk you want to assume. Um, so like this past December when I was last updating this presentation, we probably had more published data about the Falcon 500 than we had about the Neo at the time a year before that. But teams of the Neo, we had more hands-on data from the Neo teams who got their beta tests earlier in the year mm. and had brought them to the real competitions than we had with the Falcons. So our first Falcon test came in real competition this year. And obviously a lot of teams didn't get theirs until during build season. Um, so my team received four Falcons, but it was in January. So we'd already opted to go with the Neos. Um, so it's, Generally, in my personal philosophy, I can be a little bit of a ludite when it comes to new technology. I'm going to let everyone else break it for a year first before I put it on my robot. Because um, you can see, like, sometimes it's just little silly things like not having Loctite on the screw or something yeah. that can cause a drivetrain binding failure. Um, so I let the other teams work out the kinks is my personal philosophy. But if you're chasing that last couple percent, sometimes it's worth for you, for your team to go take the risk of uh, getting that higher power motor in there. And, you know, I, I subscribe to the same philosophy. We we kind of followed that last year on, our, not 2020, but 2019 on 190 when we uh, we we could have used Neos but decided not to, to see how they worked to maybe use them this year. Um, mm -hmm. But for 2020, our robot was A, going to be heavy, so we, needed to, we had to go to something. And the advantages of the Falcon looked to be too much for us to pass up, so we did try it. And we did f run into some challenges, with, like you were talking about with the screw heads and some pinion misfits, but... Um, yeah, it, it's, it's a, it's a risk you have to assess before you go into a, a, a season. You can't just expect every new product to work hundred percent accurately right out of the gate. Yeah. So jumping back in like FRC history, I remember, I think it was 2009 was the first year of the, the Jaguar motor control. Oh yeah. Oh, oh gosh. I had four of those in my robot too. Those. We loved them. And then we hated them as yeah. soon as they stopped working. <laughs> yep. And it, it scared us away from can networks for like a decade, basically. Yep, basically. Um, yeah, we I mean, we we used Jaguars in 2009 uh and eventually didn't really like them. Then the new Jaguar came out and we used an 11 with a CAN network and that crapped out on us too. And we didn't use CAN again until I think 2017. 8 years yeah, and, and like a whole different control system before we tried it again. That that was kind of that's very similar to our story where we we strayed away from CAN for the longest time until we had to get our feet wet because that was the only way to run the pneumatic control module. Yeah. <laughs> and we slowly started branching it out where 2018, we used it on our mechanisms, but we still had PWM for our drivetrain just because we wanted that failure proof drivetrain. Yep. Um, and then 2019, we used CAN all over. 2020, we used CAN all over. Got a lot of best practices to make it better. Um, and that kind of ties into a lot of the teething concerns you see, especially with new vendors or vendors expanding into a new product market. Um, with the Falcon, you, you knew what you're getting with CTRE, Crossword Electronics. It's a, it's a vendor that's been doing FRC electronics for a while. Um, so you, a lot of teams were comfortable saying, I trust their firmware, I trust their software, I trust their tools. Um, versus with Rev, when they expanded their brushless motors, there was some, this isn't a bad mouth Rev by any way, their products are great, but it's there were some teething concerns over the first season of the Neo motors where there was firmware updates and whatnot to kind of fix or expand the tool palette or fix behaviors. Right. I do think there was a couple with the, the, the Falcon as well, but that was relatively early on. So kind of moving into the power budgeting portion of the slides. You got to budget your power in a couple different ways. Um, 
one of the ways a lot of teams are super familiar with in 2020 is you only have 16 power distribution panel slots. Um, so you got to allocate those, not just for your drivetrain, but for your whole robot. If you assign eight, 10 motors to your drivetrain, if you're swerving with six motors or something, it's you're not going to have a lot of motors left for the rest of your robot. <coughs> Moreover, only half of those slots can fit a 40 amp breaker. And generally, you're going to want your drivetrain motors on 40 amp breakers. You also got to look at your power consumption per motor. That's dealing if you using a 40 amp breaker, 30, 20, 10, however many amps on the breaker. Um, fortunately, these breakers don't trip at 101% instantly. Um, they can basically support 135% almost indefinitely, as you can see on that chart on the screen that's taken out of the data sheet for these resettable breakers we use. Um, but they can support up to 200% for about a second or about seven tenths of a second or so. Um, so you can look in there and you can see how far you can exceed your 40 amps and still be driving before your breakers start tripping and you get weird stuttering behavior in your drivetrain. I generally recommend you don't design to be operating at more than 40, maybe 45 amps if you're pushing it. Sure, these things can go up to basically 50 amps without tripping, um, but you're going to have manufacturer variances and all sorts of things that can put you right on that edge. And if you're designing right up to that bleeding edge, any calculation error, any additional load you didn't factor in, the chain's too tight or whatever, suddenly you're, you're over your line there. Um, further still, you also got to look at your total power consumption in a few different ways. Um, so rather than just your individual motor, how much current does that individual motor pull? You got to look at your total voltage drop. Is that going to lead to brownouts? Um, and your total current draw, is that going to lead to tripping your main breaker? This is a much bigger concern back in the days of the C-Rio because there wasn't this brownout condition that kind of protected against it. Um, where like in 2014, this is a very drivetrain heavy game. Uh, a lot of teams had six SIM drives. And a lot of teams, not a lot of teams, but at least a handful of teams were tripping their main breaker due to total current drop problems. Yeah. Um, and unlike the resettable breakers, which will reset a second or so later, the main breaker, the thing with the red button that you press to turn off your robot, when that trips, that switch opens and you're dead for the match. Um, so you really want to avoid that. Fortunately, the Robo Rio has this brownout protection that usually kicks in before you're going to kill your main breaker. Um, so as your voltage lowers, the Robo Rio starts turning off different robot functionalities, including your motors. Um, so we'll stop you from these game ending errors. It's still not going to help you drive all that well. Um, my team's been pretty good at avoiding brownout conditions, but we had a bad battery in a match in one of our off seasons last year. And you can kind of see what happens when you brown out in that situation. The, the robot just kind of jerking over the field as it kicks in and out of this brownout condition repeatedly as the voltage sags down beneath the brownout uh, thresholds. Um, you also got to look at just when you're putting a lot of high power motors you're going to have general voltage sag across your system and you're not going to get your full 12 or 13 volts to all the different things that need it. There are some ways you can mitigate these high power draw scenarios. So your worst power draw is going to happen when you're accelerating, when you're in a pushing match, when you're stalling against the wall, stuff like that. Um, but there are different things you can use on both your software, your own code, as well as a lot of the tools uh, vendors are now giving you in these smarter motor controllers, um, like the Talon, like the Spark Max, um, even the Victor, um, where you can implement current limits. Um, you can do voltage ramping in your software where you don't go instantly up to 100% voltage feed you. Um, you could put ramps on your joystick inputs and things like that uh, to avoid these highest power draw scenarios to try to stretch more out of your power budget. And you got to do this a little bit with your whole robot, not necessarily just your drivetrain. Obviously, there's a lot of focus on there, but you got to make sure that if you're having this elevator or this uh, hooded shooter or something that's pulling a lot of current, you got to budget that power out as well, especially those power distribution panel slots. So generally, talking about motor quantities, I wrote this slide with SIM motors in mind. You can kind of implement any of the other higher power brushless motors, like the Neo or the Falcon in here, and these same rules of thumb kind of apply. <coughs> so two SIM motors is, I call it the rookie mistake. Teams will do it once, typically in the rookie year. Um, and then they'll never do it again. Just two SIM motors, and this is total drivetrain quantity, not per side. This is total both left and right side of your drivetrain. That's just not enough power with only two SIMs. Um, you're going to get into some really high current drop per motor because um, you're loading each individual motor a lot, and you're slow total power in that scenario. Um, maybe in a game, like if they reintroduce 2009 Lunacy with a low traction floor, you could re-explore this option there. But for any of the basic games you played for the past decade, stay away from only having two motors in your drivetrain. Yeah, that, that was that was the last time that Team 190 did anything but 
for Sims or Falcons in their drive line was in 2009, where we we kind of realized we didn't necessarily need them because we were slipping and sliding everywhere. Probably still, sh- I, I would have looking back would have still liked to have them on there for the acceleration, but that's a different story. I, we did two motors as well that year, and you could do four, but even the acceleration games are pretty marginal just because of how much sliding you had with the floor. Yeah. Uh, and that, you saw you see a lot of really creative solutions that year with other teams implementing like fans and other forms of propulsion to try to get the extra couple percent of marginal acceleration there. Um, but that's such a weird game that it's hard to compare. I think it's strap train. <laughs> like every now and then first throws a wrench out there that'll throw all the conventional logic out the window. Uh, 2009 did that. 2015 did that. Um, and it seems to be these are some of the le- lesser popular games when teams really have to think outside the box. Um, granted, they had some very other issues that cropped up with those games. <laughs> but kind of as Francis mentioned, four Sims has been like the standard. That's what the kit bot comes with. Um, that's what most COTS gearboxes are, or at least for a long time, are implemented for two in- motor inputs per side. Um, so four Sims has been like the bulletproof. You can get good performance out of it. Um, six Sims is now on the it's the higher side, the risky side um, for total power draw consumption reasons. It can give you some advantage, but don't do it just for the sake of doing it. Make sure that you are taking those steps to mitigate your high voltage draw scenarios, your high current draw scenarios. Um, and also keep in mind that those same mitigations you're putting in place, those current limits, they're going to limit some of your advantages you get from throwing more power in your drivetrain. Um, so if you're limiting your current in order to not brown out, you're taking away some of that advantage you get for having 15% more power. Some of that acceleration is coming back. Functionally, six mini sims is pretty similar to four sims in terms of fully rated, but it's actually going to better performance towards the end of the match. And it also spreads the heat and the power distribution across more motors. So you don't have to worry about six versus four, six mini sims versus four sims. You don't have to worry as much about tripping individual breakers or heat buildup on an individual motor. Um, so they are going to operate more efficiently because you're loading them less and they're a more efficient motor. It does use two more power, distri- power distribution panel slots, unfortunately. Um, and it's very possible to mix motors in a drivetrain, especially if you're sticking to the sim and mini sim family. But you can, you can mix brushless and brushed if you want. Um, not always give me a good reason you're doing it. Like don't just do it to do it. Um, but like, especially if you're sticking to the Sims and the mini Sims, we've looked at it before just because of space reasons where we didn't want to, we didn't end up going that way, but we needed a shorter motor in one of our spots in the drive train just to fit other elements to the robot. We looked at mixing Sims and mini Sims in that configuration. So one of the first things scouts typically ask in your pit is how fast is your robot? What they're really asking for is your free speed. Um, and that's not a great way to design a robot. It can be an effective shorthand for communicating how fast your robot is. I travel 12 feet per second or 16 feet per second, but it's not a great way to actually design your robot to accomplish game challenges faster. So free speed is basically you're just taking uh, the speed of your motor times the diameter of your wheel and dividing it by whatever gear ratio you're using. Um, That's great, but all it's using is the free speed of the motor. So obviously you can take a window motor and you could take a falcon and gear them to have the same speed but obviously the falcon is going to give you a lot more a lot superior performance to window motor just because the power free speed doesn't factor acceleration in now um, to, to break in real quick i have seen robots with four window motors in the drive line um sorry bill fred it was oh i don't know i don't know this is a different team beside that one but the, the year that i saw this the window motors you could only have two of them on your uh oh, on your no. robot and they had one on each wheel so that was a fun experience, but that's a different story. So not only did they, they choose a poor motor, they also broke the rules and had to redesign the drivetrain at the event. That's, well, that's rough. yeah, they should have, but this uh, is a different story. Anyway, continue, Sean. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. Um, so yeah, it, free speed doesn't do anything to describe the acceleration of your robot. That's part of the reason, aside of like some supercars, you never see a car manufacturer advertising the top speed of their car because you know that car is never going to get to top speed. What you see advertised is it's zero to 60 speed. Mm. How fast does it accelerate up to the speed you want? And that's kind of what the mentality you want to take when designing a drivetrain for first robotics is how long does it take to move from point A to point B? What good is going really fast or having that really fast top speed if you don't have enough runway to get to your top speed? If I gear my robot for 80 feet per second, um, sure, I can throw enough power to maybe get to 80 feet per second eventually, but it's going to take me too long. I'm not going to be able to do that in the confines of 54 feet on the field. 
So how do we do this better? What's a better way to actually design your drivetrain? It starts with figuring out where your sprints are in the field. What are your sprint distances? How much time does it take to move between point A and point B? Where are point A and point B? Um, and this really kind of goes into a strategy decision um, that's a great team exercise, even if you're not looking to optimize your drivetrain, even if you're just building the kit bot, doing something like this can really break down your match strategy and determine how you expect the game to flow. Um, so you look at where do you load your game pieces, where do you have to score your game pieces, what do you have to go around to get between those points. Um, this year it's, am I going through the generator switch? Am I going under the uh, control panel? Um, and you can kind of start using that to map out where you're loading, where you're shooting, um, where you're scoring in general, and where your match flow is going to be. And then you kind of take, what's the longest distance between those waypoints? It can be as simple as what's the distance between where I load and where I score, but sometimes you may have things in your way that's going to cause you to decelerate. Uh, for a lot of teams, you're probably not full gunning it under that control panel. You're going to take some time to align and go under there properly. <coughs> and the other big factor is do not forget the autonomous mode, especially if you're a team that has any autonomous aspirations to do something more than just the, the simplest stuff. Autonomous is the most time-sensitive portion of the match. Generally speaking, your whole cycle is not going to take you 120 seconds for teleop. An autonomous cycle well may take you all 15 seconds, and you need to you or 20 seconds or 10 seconds, whatever it is that year, and you need to minimize the amount of time you try, amount of time you need traveling in that period to give your robot the most time it takes to score. Um, some examples: uh, 2015, getting the three-toed autonomous done, it really pushed teams up against the 15 seconds to try to load three totes and do the swerving that was required to do that. Um, 2017, the hoppers, if you're trying to score a bunch of balls in autonomous, where they're worth three times as much, giving your time more, giving your team more time to shoot really could matter in how many points those were credited versus, in autonomous versus teleop. And 2018, uh, power up, that was a year with the most obvious like example of how a sprint can matter. Because getting to that scale first, it was a time-based scoring objective. You get it tilted towards your team scoring points earlier, and you can even screw up the other team's routine by having it elevated when they get there. I also give you more time to score multiple game pieces. So as you see more and more teams trying to score their preloads and add game pieces, these autonomous sprints are becoming increasingly important to teams to design around. So I'm going to go through a bunch of examples now. Um, when I first created this presentation, 2016 it was fresh in everyone's mind. Now I realize um, the seniors this year were in like eighth grade when this game was around. Uh, <laughs> so it's probably not the one I should be leading off with anymore. Um, but now all the mentors feel old. Uh, but in general, yep. this was a game where the sprints weren't super long. You didn't need this 25 foot per second free speed to get across the field super fast because there were these what were called defenses in the outer works portion of the field that there were ramps or gates you had to open or a bar you had to drive underneath, stuff like that that would slow you down. So in order between where you're loading balls in the middle of the field or in your secret passage and where you're scoring them, these sprints are much shorter distances. Um, especially there are some teams that would offense effectively just never leave their offensive side of the field once they got the defenses damaged. Um, and they're only driving these 10, 12 foot distances. They didn't need a two speed drive train. They didn't need a super high speed drive train to do these long sprints back and forth across the field. Um, 118 that year, a very successful team had like a one speed drive train geared for about 12 feet per second. Um, the longest scenario you'd see is some of these low bar cycling teams who would score in the low goal. That's kind of the maroon line on the bottom of the screen. Those might be the longest sprints you'd consider depending on your strategy. 2010 breakaway, it's a very similar example um, where you had these big dividing humps between the zones. You can try to Dukes a hazard it over those humps, but good luck. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> there's a couple teams that year. I'm trying to remember the team number that had the roly poly robot that would kind of oh, roll over the humps. Yes, I remember them. They, they intentionally would roll themselves onto their top to cross the humps. Yeah, it was, it was super cool to see. Yeah. But it's also, you're not full gunning it. Even in that scenario, you have two seconds of rolling over after you go over that hump. Um, and you can see like 294 in the picture I have there. It's they're practically in the air as they go over that thing. Um, you had to, you weren't gunning that full speed to get over generally. And even if you were, you're slowing down as you crest it. Um, but the one kind of the counter example that I'm providing here is these black lines at the bottom left might be what you consider your typical sprints in the longest case scenarios. But we had a match that year where we couldn't get around our defender. Um, the two goals were in the opposite corners on the bottom. Um, and we would try to go to one goal, they'd cut us off. We'd try to go for the other goal, they'd cut us off. They had more effectively designed their sprint for that 27-foot narrow distance there than we had. Um, so that's something you may want to consider is 
hey, maybe instead of loading, I want to consider what's the best ca- or the worst case scenario for my sprint to get around a defender from end to end goal. So in 2015 Recycle Rush, this is kind of the crowning example of you don't need to move super fast. <laughs> um, all these black lines showed the different teleop sprints that were possible. And generally, most of these are, for two of the four, you're practically just turning around between where you're loading game pieces either in the landfill or from the human player and the zones you're scoring on. You pick up the object, you turn around, you drive maybe a foot. Um, you don't need a super high acceleration. You don't need a super high free speed to do these sprints effectively, especially considering you're carrying around six totes in a giant stack that you can knock over if you go too fast. Um, the only scenarios where you may want something a little bit faster is kind of on the maroon lines on the left side of the screen or some of these autonomous sprints if you're going for the three tote or the three bin autonomous. But even those, it's not truly a straight line. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, we have games like 2017 where you're driving across the full field repeatedly. This is the, these are the games where people really start to look at cycles. Now, that term gets used a lot for almost every game uh, these days, but games like 2013 and 2017 and 2020 this year to an extent are really these cycle-based games where you're going from one end of the field, you're going from your loading station to your scoring area repeatedly one, two, three, four, five times a match over and over again. And this is where you're looking at these two-thirds of the length of the field types of sprints where your max speed starts to become a bigger factor in how quickly you get uh, back and forth across the field. Initially, I showed that black line that shows if you wanted to gear for an autonomous sprint, um, that might be the type of scenario in which you do it um, in order to give yourself more time to score those preloaded objects in from the hoppers. 2013, it's a very similar story. You're going about two-thirds of the length of the field from your loading station to the pyramid, to your protected area where you want to shoot. Um, and even with these long sprints, sometimes it's still best to design in what you can, uh, can do controllably. 610 was one of the best cycle robots this year, uh, or in 2013, that is. And they only geared for about 12 or 13 feet per second. Um, but it's, it is still a longer sprint, so you don't want to too heavily cap your max speed. But design within your means what you can control. So there are some games that just completely break this mold of looking at the sprint distance. Um, a couple of them, 2009 Lunacy, you picked up balls and you scored them in trailers towed by other robots. There wasn't a set place you're scoring. You can't, there is no waypoint you can pick to create your sprint distance. <clears throat> the fundamental problem is you needed to outrun and outmaneuver the other bots on the super low traction floor of Lunacy. Um, so Wilson became a big factor. You just wanted to, you basically just needed to gear your robot to accelerate as best you could and try to move as best you could. And you needed to do it against some unknown variable, which is the other team. 2014 Aerial Assist did have predetermined scoring locations um, and roughly predetermined loading locations. Granted, you could inbound the ball from feet away if you needed to. Um, but most of that game was focused on robot to robot interaction, passing from alliance partner to human player, passing from alliance partner to alliance partner, and really just dealing with defenders. So games in which the primary interaction or the primary method on the field is another robot, it kind of throws away the sprint distance to an extent. Um, so you have to try to optimize against how do I get an advantage over another team, um, whether it's in terms of available traction, available power, available acceleration. Um, you play these variables to get the behavior you want to give you an advantage over other teams. So a couple more recent examples. Um, this is literally something that I stole off of Dogma Slack from January 7th of last year as we were looking at different sprint distances for the game Deep Space. Um, there's a lot of different options, but a lot of these, with the exception of a couple of the weirder ones, are in the same range. There's only a couple of feet of distance variability in these. Um, ultimately, the one we picked was in the bottom left, at 17 feet between the loading station and the rocket. We decided we wanted to be a rocket bot. We determined that was the sprint that we were going to be doing most often is between picking up a hatch and going to the rocket. So that's what we picked, but we knew that that was going to be relatively similar to what we wanted to do in Autonomous, be relatively similar to loading cargo into the rocket, excuse me. Um, so it wasn't a whole lot of stuff. I will point in mind that all these numbers, these are just the raw distances. As I'm going to talk about in a couple of slides here, you're going to need to subtract the length of your robot from these. You're going to need to subtract deceleration time from these unless you really want to go face first into some of these scoring objects, which <laughs> mixed, mixed results there depending on the game. Now, can, um, I, can I just ask real quick, when you determined the, the, the 17 feet that you wanted to travel, was that, just to be, make sure we're clear, was that based on what your strategic priority led you to drive to, to design your drivetrain, or was yeah. your, your preferred drivetrain leading the other direction? So we, 
we go with a West Coast drive and then the tailor our gear ratios and our wheel choices and our motor choices towards the strategy. Okay. Um, so that's one of the things we really like about West Coast drive is it's very customizable um, towards the solutions. That's kind of what I built this presentation around is assuming teams can pick the different gear ratios to fit in there, which I'll talk about a little bit in a little a little bit here, but uh, there's a lot of variable options in the COTS market now that let you pick your ratio for what you want. Okay. Um, but yeah, we, we we picked our game strategy and then said, how do we want to gear our drivetrain to best fit our strategy? Um, so this is why it's a really important strategy discussion to do, um, even if it's you're not necessarily have a whole lot of a design envelope to, to push within. Um, and I have even less on this slide. This is literally just a picture of our whiteboard from 2020. <laughs> Uh, I threw it in here last minute. Um, and like this, this wasn't even done by our mechanical design lead. This was our strategy lead, our control systems lead, and our, actually our branding deputy is the one who drew the field on the, the whiteboard. Um, so it, it's kind of a full team activity of look at the different parties you want to be associated with designing and how your robot functions and what you want to design your drive trains toward to achieve those functions. Um, so ultimately we picked about 20 feet for 2020. Um, it's still kind of too early to say whether that, that was the right decision for us. But we were looking at sprinting between the loading station and the back of the DJ booth or the color wheel or the uh, control panel, as it's actually called. Um, <laughs> Wait, you say you call it the DJ booth? That We picked that one up at Hatbro, yeah. Um, it, <laughs> it seemed like a pretty applicable name, and teams understood that easier than saying the control panel. <laughs> okay. You're standing back there, and you're spinning it. It's, it's a DJ booth. Yeah. <laughs> um, but for our initial strategy, we were looking at shooting from the trench, either long side or short side. And either way, that goes from the loading station to that area. So that's kind of why we picked that distance, as well as it overlapped with a lot of the distances for autonomous routines we were considering at the time. Say we wanted to start lined up relative to the center, uh, shoot our preloads, and then go for those balls that are right underneath the control panel. It's a very similar 19.7 feet versus 20.5 feet as we measured out there. Um, so we, we looked at that and said, hey, let's let's build our sprint around that. It, it kind of chunks into the different portions of the game we wanted to do. And once again, these are distances without subtracting the distance of the robot yet, without factoring deceleration or stuff that we'll talk about in a little bit. So taking this data, oh, I do have one more example before I go there. 2018 Power Up, this is kind of the, the best one I have uh, the most data for. There is a ton of options for what your sprint distance is, depending on where you're loading from, and that changes as the match flow changes. Um, up on here on the screen, there's I'm showing a thousand different ways to do it. The only one that's super long is if you were, for some reason, loading from the opposite side, uh, human player station, and driving them all the way back to your portal. Um, that's probably not a good strategy if you're if you're playing a uh, if you're playing a a, a power up bot. You're probably going to go with that black line that's loading from the pyramid and basically just turning around. But almost all these are shorter sprints, um, with the exception of any time you're going to your far portal to load your human player cubes. Uh, but it can vary dramatically depending on which pads get colored on, where you're starting in autonomous, and which cubes are left on the field in that pyramid and along the fence. So it's kind of hard to pick. And for teleop priorities, it's kind of hard to pick, hey, what's our sprint going to be? And it also, teleop wasn't necessarily the most important part of that game. So looking at these, we decided, hey, we don't want to design our sprint to be any of these on the field. We want to look at autonomous. We wanted to be a scale bot based on our priorities that year. We said we were going to be a high goal team. So that led to playing on the scale. <laughs> Excuse me. So we were looking at the two different scale autonomous options where it's either going straight if you get the platform right in front of you, or if the plates reverse, you have to cross over the field, likely behind the switch rather than cutting off your alliance partners. Um, so that's kind of the maroon line versus the black lines. Um, ultimately, we decided for us that we we're going to prioritize for that maroon line the straightaway. It, ought, it turned out to be pretty similar to our curved crossover speed anyway, um, as things worked out. But in order to get this to an actual number of how what is this sprint distance, we took at the geometry of the field. Um, we started by saying, hey, half the field is 27 feet long. But as I mentioned a couple times, you have a robot that occupies some of that space. The scoring platform occupies some of that space, and you have to decelerate. So using this little brown cube as a proxy for a robot, um, we subtracted the length of the robot. We decided we wanted to we subtracted the half the length of the, of the scale plate because you don't want to run into that. And we added a little bit of, at the time, just fudge factor for deceleration. We can conceptualize our actual distance we want to optimize for is about 18 feet. And it worked out pretty well for us. We can get to the platforms very quickly. Um, I don't have any of our videos loaded in here. Um, if you go look at our match video, you can see that we're getting there in a matter of seconds, pretty close to what we theorized we would be. 
Um, and we had two and a half scale, almost three scale autonomous routines, despite only being able to load on one side of our robot. Um, as well as we got, with the exception of one team that actually shot cubes into the uh, the, the, uh, the scale, we were the fastest team for getting our first cube up in Mar. That really helped. It played to our advantage this year because in 2018, because you had a big advantage of getting to that scale first. So optimizing that sprint really didn't matter. It's not going to save you tons of time overall. You're only going to be saving fractions of a second. But in a game like 2018, fractions of a second really mattered. One of the big reasons we won Ramp Riot one of our off seasons that year is we got our scale cubes up first before 225 did, and 225 missed their later cubes because the scale was up. Um, so kind of summarizing all this for as you're optimizing for sprint distance, um, there's a lot of online tools that I'm going to show you one of in a minute that can help you take this information of... I have this 18 feet, how do I turn this into what motors and ratios I want to pick? Um, but you can play with a whole bunch of variables as you're doing that, what motors you're using, what wheel size you're using, uh, what gear ratios you're picking, the weight of your robot, et cetera. There's a lot of cot solutions that allow you a pretty big design envelope even if you don't have design resources to create custom gearboxes. Um, West Coast products, we typically use the West Coast products one speed gearboxes that gives us a bunch of different gear ratios to pick from. We have a box just filled with all the different spur gears and we match them up until we get the ratio we want. Um, but the same thing is supported by Andy Mark shifters, um, supported by some Vex Pro shifters. Um, there's one and two speed options that do this. Um, even the, the tough box that's used in the kit of parts these days comes with three or four different ratio options you can pick from. Additionally, anytime you're not direct driving a wheel, you're going to have a belt or a chain or even a gear afterwards, and you can play with that ratio there to get the speed you want. Um, like I just mentioned, it's not going to revolutionize your end-to-end -end speed on the field, but it can shave off the fractions of a second that sometimes add up and can really matter when you're doing a head-to-head -head scoring objective, kind of like 2018. Um, so the, the first tool I want to talk about is the Eyelet Drive Simulator, and I'm going to pop into Excel here to actually show it to you. But it's available on Chief Delphi. It's produced by Jesse Knight, who's a mentor on 1885 Eyelet. Um, so hopefully this doesn't break anything as I change windows here. Uh, that's okay. It should be fine. All right, it looks like it's showing it to you. Let me get it up there. All right, hopefully you guys are seeing this. Uh, well, just one quick second. I think we got a look like we got a big black nothing right now. Um, do you want to just make sure your presentation's closed and minimize it there? Yeah, let me do that real fast. All right, are you getting the uh, Excel now? Up well, there? let's uh, let's take a quick quick change. Uh, one quick change here. Uh, pardon me, everybody, while we disappear for. Just a moment. We haven't actually disappeared. Uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. We're getting it in now. All yep, right. I think we got it. So we'll be putting it right up back on screen here. Sorry about that, guys. No, it's good. All right. So when you first look at this, it's super intimidating. Um, and it did take me a long time to start figuring out. And he releases new update versions every year that I always have to sit down for a couple hours and be like, all right, what changed? What's new here? What's different? What do I actually care about? Um, but fortunately now, Jesse also has his own YouTube videos that explain a lot of what he did and his rationale behind this. So I definitely recommend checking those out in addition to this. Um, this is the tool that 1712 uses for our drivetrain designs. I know a lot of other teams are playing with it as well. Um, so it gives you a lot of options that create these different outputs all over the screen. Um, so if you go up to the motors in the top left, you can pick different preloaded motor data based on what motors you want to use. Um, it does only support using the same motor and you can change the quantities. If you want to create your own mixed motors, you'll have to go into the back end and add a, a mixed motor configuration. Um, and then it'll produce, it lets you pick the number of motors, lets you. Oh, we seem to have a little bit of an issue there. We'll be right back, everybody. Just hold on for one quick second.
All righty, we had a quick check there, and we're back in business. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your patience, everybody. Uh, so go on ahead and uh, continue, Sean. Thank you very much. Sorry again about that, guys. My Discord exploded there for a second when I was <laughs> playing around in uh, Excel. Um, so hopefully now we don't get any weird full screens again. But uh, here's kind of the motor options you can pick from. You can scroll down even to the ones you'd never ever use in a drivetrain. Um, for the moment, I'm going to leave it on the Neos. You can change your quantity of motors. You can change your different gear selections, wheel diameter, so on and so forth, all throughout the different options here. And as you do that in real time, it's going to update all these different uh, graphs and outputs based on the data you're providing into it. So I just changed from four inch wheels, and I'll change it back to six, and you'll see all these different graphs update. Um, these different graphs, may, you, depending on your own team's priorities, you may care more or less about different ones of these. It also does give you some of the traditional metrics up in the top, the, the free speed, um, your, and other things like that. Like this one right now shows 15.1 feet per second. Some of the ones that, we, that I like to look at a lot um, are whether or not I'm going to be have my wheels slip because I'm going to be talking about traction limiting in a slide or two here. Um, I'm going to look at how close I am to browning out my robot, what kind of current limits I need to implement, and most importantly, what my time to my target is. So if you come down here to field and match characteristics, um, you can set your desired sprint distance. So if I'm going to set that to that 18 feet from 2018 that we'd come up with. Um, that can be my desired sprint distance. Also, if you, while this tool didn't exist, or this portion of the tool didn't exist in 2018, you can now pick how you're decelerating, which is really more for autonomous because your driver is going to decelerate in some kind of mixed method. Um, and even our autonomous routines kind of exist in the mixed method where it's somewhere between full reverse and a brake mode. Um, where it's, the brake mode is basically the speed controller shunts the leads together to, to brake it. Um, but your three options are reverse, coast, and brake. Um, I simulate using reverse if I'm looking at autonomous. So with an 18-foot sprint distance and my deceleration method reverse, um, with these current preloaded values, which are the kit apart values, decided of me changing it to a Neo, I can look at my movement characteristics um, and see that if you look at that teal line, the acceleration is kind of going crazy. That's because right under that, you'll see that orange line saying I'm being current, current limited for a while. Um, so I might want to look at adjusting my current limits. So if I come down here to the electrical system characteristics, um, you can play with your current limit promoter, um, and you can raise it or lower it to adjust whether or not that current limit comes into play. So if I lower it here, I see a lot less acceleration across the board because I'm current limited almost constantly. So I'm going to go ahead and set that to about 50 amps. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to mechanically reduce the load so I'm not seeing as many current limits in that situation, or I might play with the pinion gear that I have on there to get a little bit less current limit, or I might change this from a 20 to a 48 to a 20 to like a 54 or something like that. And I can keep reducing the amount of time I'm spent current limiting. Um, that is if current limiting is the primary thing you're designing around. Um, the other thing you want to look at is an electrical characteristics graph. They have that big red line at 7 volts, or it's actually 6.9 volts. That's the first stage of the Rio brownout. You generally want to try to stay above that, keep your system voltage and your applied voltage well above that, or else you're going to get into brownout states. So uh, just, just so I can make sure I'm reading this correctly, that purple line on the electric characteristics graph is below the red line. Does that mean that this is a brownout condition right now? So the purple line is your per motor current. Okay. Um, it's the dotted black line and the dotted blue lines that you want to keep above that red line. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, because that's your applied voltage and your system voltage. Um, your per motor current, you're going to want to keep beneath where your breakers would be tripping. Um, or in this case, it's you'll, when you see those plateaus at 50 amps, it's because we have that 50 amp current limit. If I were to raise this up to 150, which is the equivalent of not having one, you'll see that it gets up there to about 60 amps at times, and we're really risking tripping our breakers. Okay. Um, but in terms of when you start optimizing, like this will give you some characteristics of how your drive's performing in general. When you want to get into how do I optimize my drive frame, I'm going to zoom out just a little bit here so we can get a little bit more of the screen. Um, one of the graphs, or one of the graphs that I look at the most um, is this trade-offs for match performance, um, where you have this solid black line and this dashed black line. And then the x-axis here is actually different gear ratios. Um, oh. Your selected gear ratio will be this dotted red line that's going vertically up that uh, plot. But based on your what you have set for your wheel size, your weight, so on and so forth, it's going to look at this and your motor selection. It's going to look at this and say, what gear ratios will have the lowest times, the y-axis value, to get to your sprint distance that you set earlier in the spreadsheet. 
Um, so if you look at this one, if you're just looking at time to goal, you're not factoring your deceleration at all. Um, with the characteristics we have set in there, it's it's right around eight to nine to one. Um, and you can see that even even then we're talking fractions of a second between five to one and 12 to one, you're all still under two seconds. Um, but obviously that's a pretty large window to be designing within. The solid black line is the same thing, but it's factoring that time to stop, whether you picked coast, break, or, de or um, full reverse is your deceleration method. Um, so given that my team is focused a lot of times on the autonomous sprints, we usually go with the version that has that braking simulation in there. Um, so we usually design more towards that black line. We don't necessarily always go perfectly on the, the slot there. We may play with it a little bit depending on our current limits, depending on how many motors we have available um, to match some of these other characteristics. Um, the top rate graph, the trade-offs for current limiting is also something we look at where as you move that current limit, how does it affect your total travel time, which is that black line there, and how does it affect your system voltage, uh, which is the purple line there, um, to make sure that you're not dropping into brownout conditions, to make sure that, like, if I were to set this current limit all the way up at, like, 25 amps, something ridiculously low, um, you'll see that red line all the way over there. I'll, I'll set it to 30 so you can actually see that red line. Um, you see that it's intersecting with that black line at a point where it's no longer at the lowest point where it's three seconds. It's actually impacting your math performance to set your current limit that low. That's a very conservative current limit. And you also see as I updated the current limits, all the other graphs changed accordingly. Um, so this is a really powerful tool. Um, and if you have some time or questions at the end, I might hop back into this to show you guys a little bit more. Um, but I'm going to keep moving on to the presentation for now. Um, I definitely recommend checking out Jesse Knight's videos on this. Um, I'm sure you can find them on YouTube or uh, Chief Delphi. And he goes through almost all the, or he goes through every different portion of the spreadsheet and kind of showing you the different things you can do with it. Um, so I hop back into PowerPoint here. Sure. So it displays on the right screen. All right. Let me know if that's displaying properly. Yes. Looks like we should be good to go. So you can uh, go ahead and, uh, yep, continue. All right. Um, so I'll click past these couple slides. So that's just what I just talked about there. We're going to talk about traction limiting a little bit. Um, so traction limiting is what happens when you drive are putting out into your max torque, what behavior ends up happening? Are you stalling your motors or are your wheels slipping on the carpet or whatever flooring substance there is? Um, so if your wheel slipped, you're what we refer to as being limited by your traction or traction limited. Um, I like to design traction limited drivetrains because traction yeah. limiting helps mitigate excessive current draw. Um, you're not stalling your motors. Hopefully your motors are turning at least at a certain amount because your wheels are slipping on the carpet. Um, and th so it helps mitigate tons of current because you're not selling your motors, which helps also mitigate how much heat build up, which helps save your motors. Um, something like a sim, you might be able to get away with it, but if you're putting more aggressive motor in there, a brushless motor or a 775 Pro, if you get into drivetrains that are not traction limited, you can really start smoking these motors and doing bad things to them. It's also important to understand where your traction limits happen um, because torque beyond what's required to break your wheels free of the carpet, it's mostly going to waste. Um, you're pushing power, air quotes, the teams care about. I want to be able to win this pushing match. That's determined by how much traction you have more often than it's determined by how much torque you have. So gearing down, um, it's not going to give you more torque that's transferable to other robots. It may still put your traction limit at a current point that's actually achievable. Uh, it's possible a traction limited drivetrain that doesn't break traction until you're putting 60, 70 amps into your drive motors, in which case you're not actually traction limited. So sometimes gearing down can still matter. You're just not going to get that extra pounds of force to apply to the other robot. But so basically, if you're going to use like we'll say like standard sort of wheels, like maybe like the Any Mark four inch you know wheels mm -hmm. or what have you, or the Vex wheels, you're probably not going to get a significant advantage by gearing your drivetrain down to push people. Yeah, it's your assuming that you're still within the realms of like the kit apart drivetrain. You haven't changed yeah. your ratio wildly. It's you're not going to get a whole lot more torque or a lot more pushing force by gearing down more. Um, granted, there's still a lot of really, really weird things that happen in pushing matches, especially yeah. when people's bumpers start pushing together. You get all sorts of weird bumper locking things where some of the robots rate from one robot may transfer to the other robot. So there are weird edge cases that happen, but just because you geared your robot to only move four feet per second because you wanted all the pushing power in the world, what you really end up doing is just breaking your wheels free to slide on the floor a lot easier. Um, so how do we evaluate how much traction your robot has? Well, that drivetrain calculator I just showed you does a whole lot towards doing that. Um, but there's also some mathematical stuff. The, the first order is basically just your force of static friction is your coefficient of static friction times your normal force. And your normal force 90% of the time is your weight. Um, 
this doesn't fully describe everything that happens in a real world, but it's good enough first order application that it works for FRC design. Um, there may be interactions that happen beyond that. Um, certain wheels kind of dig in and form like a cleat like effect into the carpet. Um, or in a game like 2013, there was actually a metal grating on the ramp. And my team in high school attempted to have our, our, tre our treads have the same pitch as that grating so we could lock into that grating. Oh, yeah. It didn't work that well, but yep. it, was, it was a cool idea. Well, the team, the team 190 robot did that as well that year, uh, but it led to their wheels being, uh, I think, like 14 inches in diameter. So, oh, <laughs> yeah, it's, sometimes you carry it to the point of it just being silly. <laughs> um, and then you also got to keep in mind there are multiple surfaces on the field. Carpet typically is the field surface, but you've had a lot of HDP or other types of surfaces. Where you can get kind of stiction or different effects between wheels and that surface. Um, Empirically, there's some data that shows larger contact patches, even though contact patch, the amount of space you have between your wheel and your carpet doesn't play into that equation I showed you. Some empirical data shows that it can affect things, um, but I don't go overboard with it. Uh, teams try to go that tank tread route to maximize their traction. I am generally not a supporter of that, but uh, if you really are trying to chase that last couple percent of traction advantage, you may want to consider it. <laughs> but the biggest factors here are how do you increase your coefficient of static friction? And how do you increase your normal force? And that basically means your robot weight matters a lot. And so does the things that you're picked up by your robot. Um, the last several years, we haven't had a whole lot of heavy game pieces. But if you go back in FRC history, you can find some. Um, the, the Tetras in 2005 were a couple pounds each. And there weren't limits on how many you could hold. So those were heavy. In 2015 in Recycle Rush, mm. holding six totes can noticeably change the amount of robot your weight. And the most uh, extreme examples all the way back in 2002, where you had these like 90, 100 pound mobile goals, but there's no rule against picking them up. Um, so a couple teams had the bright idea of if I pick these goals up, my normal force is now way bigger than anyone else's, and no one can push me anymore. And and not to not to not to to uh, you know send this too far off the rails, but um, one thing that that I, I want to bring up is in, in 1999, way way back in the day, back in the 1900s, as we say. Um, the <laughs> last millennium. Yes. Um, Team 190's robot, actually, there was this large, what they called the puck, which was like 400 pounds, this huge mm -hmm. thing that you'd have to climb onto at the end of the match. And they actually would lift the puck up into the air by about, you know, a few inches to sort of get get it so nobody could uh, climb onto it because most robots were designed to climb at the height, not two inches or three inches higher than the height. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they got like you were saying, the tra the advantage there because they made it so people couldn't get up, and then they also got the advantage that they now had like whatever the component of like four or five hundred pounds of weight on their wheels, so it was impossible to move them or dislodge them or to to free them from the the puck. So, and it worked well until it broke. But uh, <laughs> That's but how yes, it goes sometimes. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so then, important thing to consider, especially when you're going in. Uh, like a swerve drive or a cannon drive direction is where is your center of mass located? Mm. Um, with a tank drive, each side of your robot's wheels are mechanically linked. So there are that side of the drivetrain is all going to slip or not slip at the same time. But with the mechanum or some Omni or a swerve drive, each of your wheels are mechanically independent of one another. So if you have a lot more weight on the front end of your robot, your back wheels are going to slip well before your front wheels. Um, that was an issue that some teams faced in 2015. It's, they have a relatively balanced robot. They start picking up these heavy game pieces and suddenly their back wheel slips before the wheels on the front side do. Um, so you got to look at stuff like that. Try to keep your center map. Generally, unless you have like some really cool thing you're trying to design out on an edge case for, or you want your center of mass out on a side so certain wheels slip at different times. Sure, you can do something cool, but most teams want to keep it generally in the center of your robot. Um, so taking this and all we've learned so far, you can kind of start building models of whether or not you want to build a one-speed or a two-speed drivetrain. I would recommend against a two-speed drivetrain for the sake of a two-speed drivetrain, but if you can create a good reason why you want one, then go for it. Um, shifting gearboxes, they add weight, they add size, cost, complexity, and additional point of failure. And typically, they require a whole pneumatic system, which you may or may not want for other portions of your robot. Um, so if you look at your sprint distance, and then you come up with your speed required to achieve that sprint distance optimally, and then you can see if that speed, whether or not it is traction limited. If it's not traction limited, maybe you want to add a two-speed shifter to give you that low gear to have that traction limited speed in addition to your sprint speed. Um, that would be a scenario in which you want a two-speed gearbox. Um, 
there may be other scenarios in which you have realistic need for more torque than your sprint pro speed provides. Um, but do keep in mind that a lot of teams go in the mentality, I want to win a pushing match. If you're in a pushing match already, the defender's typically done their job. Um, winning that pushing match isn't going to radically change the speed in which you score your goals. Um, it's going to be, if they're there, they're slowing you down. They're adding time onto your cycle. They're making it take longer for you. Um, so do consider how much winning a pushing match actually matters to your team or versus coming up with another technique to get out of the pushing match. Um, you can also look at, in order to be traction limited or in order to draw the acceleration you want, how much current are you drawing? And if you need a lower gear to mechanically, physically reduce your current draws, your loads on your motors. Um, so that may be a scenario in which you want to add a low gear to your drivetrain beyond your typical driving gear. Um, and really on the bleeding edge of things, you've seen some cool teams do some auto shifting code that will try to mimic what we do in automobiles, where we use different gear ratios to be at maximum efficiency at different points of acceleration. Um, that's something you really got to do empirically and test a lot internally to your team with your drive solution to make sure that it's actually helping you. Because um, our sprints in FRC are, they're three seconds, four seconds at the most generally. You're not spending a whole lot of time doing it. Um, so that tiny bit you can gain with an auto shifting code, you may end up hurting yourself more just by the dwell time between your low gear and your high gear when you lose power for that fraction of a second. And you have to, or when you change your loading on your motor from low gear to high gear and you have to accelerate again. Um, so really carefully consider that if you want to use that as your rationale. Um, the other thing I'll mention is like in my personal experience and the experience of many other teams, including some very high level teams, they'll build a two speed shifter and spend 90 to hundred percent of the year in one year or the other. Yep. Um, <laughs> almost every time we build a two speed, it's we stuck in one year and we shifted like twice all season and it really wasn't worth it. Um, and like even teams as good as 254 have done this, where it's they build a two-speed shifter and they stay in one gear. They realize that's the only gear they need to play the game. Um, so do consider whether it's actually paying off in the end. That yeah. being said, the one other scenario I don't have mentioned on the slide is if your autonomous sprint is very, very different from your teleop sprint, maybe you can have an autonomous gear and teleop gear, and the driver never worries about switching. Just the code does it at the start of teleop, and you end up in whatever gear it is. Um, so now I'm going to get into some general tips and then wrap up. Uh, getting into the Q&A and whatnot. Um, I can credit this first one to Ty Tremblay because he said it on an RSN thing, but it's really kind of an FRC adage that's been around a while. I've heard before. It's a drivetrain won't win you a competition, but it can certainly lose you one. Yep. Um, if you get this extra 2% from optimizing your drivetrain, great, but your mechanism still got to do everything to actually win the game. Um, say what you will about 2008 and bots like 148 or 3D1 that cycled with field a thousand times, but don't do so much work on your drivetrain that it starts taking away from your other mechanisms. Build a drivetrain that's reliable, that you can trust on the field. Um, and that's the most important part of building any drivetrain. Sure, there's these steps you can do to take beyond that to get a little bit better, but don't let that stand in the way of you building a better mechanism. And certainly don't let it stand in the way of the reliability of your drivetrain. If your drivetrain's not reliable, your robot's not reliable, and you're probably not going to get picked. Also, consider your practice space and don't your robot faster than your driver's able to handle. If your practice space is only 17 feet long, you probably don't want to pick a sprint distance that's longer than 17 feet because you're never going to get to test that. You're never going to get to practice that. You won't be able to test autonomous in that area. Granted, some teams don't have a whole lot of practice space and they're going to have to do the best they can at competition. Uh, but if you do have the, if you are fortunate enough to have a practice space, design around what your practice space supports. Um, I mentioned this a couple of times, but gearing down doesn't just provide a higher stall torque. It also means you pull less current at other torque values. Um, so when you're doing your power budgeting, um, really consider what advantages you can get from creating more mechanical advantage, more torque in your favor, just for sake of lowering your current um, and reducing the battery draw you have. Um, when you're making drivetrain decisions, try not to tunnel vision in on any one fix or another. Um, try to tune everything together. Pick your wheels, your weight, your frame, your motor allocation, et cetera. Look at all the different options you have in front of you and say, this is how I want to do it. Um, part of our decisions this year when we were making 1712's drive decision, we were looking at whether we we're going to go with four Neos or six Neos in our drivetrain. And ultimately, as we looked at the rest of the robot, we said, hey, those two power distribution panels are probably going to matter. Let's just stick with four in there so we can have more motors to do the rest of our robot. And it was a good decision because if we had put six in there, we would have we would have, we would have merged more mechanisms than we already have merged into uh, single motor solutions. 
Um, and ultimately, like you can spend all this time tweaking your your motors, tweaking your gear ratios, do all this, but the rest of your robot is going to have just as big of an impact on anything, especially your weight, especially your center of mass. Um, I'm sure a lot of teams who were around a couple of years ago and power up and built these tall elevators, and even last year in Deep Space built these tall elevators and these tall arms, uh, learned that a higher center of gravity. And if you try to, if you have a high CG and you try to floor it forwards or floor it reverse, you're going to tip over. Um, or at the very minimum, you're going to waste a lot of your energy tipping up or tipping back. Um, so a lower CG matters a lot. Um, the more weight you have, the more traction you have, um, the more pushing power you'll have, but also the higher current you're going to draw in order to accelerate, um, in order to be traction limited. The less weight you have, the better acceleration you're going to have, and the lower current draws you're going to have, but the lower max traction traction you're going to have. So there's really kind of the economy there of whether you want to build to maximize your traction or you want to build to be the smaller, nimble, lighter weight robot. Um, it just depends on what your strategic goals are for that game, how big your mechanisms are going to have to be. Now you can have the greatest ideal you want. You want to build this tiny robot with low weight, but then your mechanism ends up weighing 45 pounds and taking up a two foot by two foot area, which is not going to happen. <laughs> So really take a look at your whole robot and try to decide which side of the spectrum you're designing towards. And like in a game like 2017, where for the, the very high end shooter teams, they want to hold all these balls. They know that if they're building the shooter robot, they're not going to build this less weight solution. To the one you end up seeing them do. And a lot of these teams in the postseason, um, when they realize the disparity between gears and balls is a couple of these teams built redesigned robots for the, the postseason or even during season to be these tiny 65, 70 pound gear runners that can use less motors, that can use more aggressive gear ratios and still get tons of acceleration. Um, so the last thing, I got some additional resources here. Um, you can find them on the FRC or on Dogma's YouTube channel. I have links to all these. You can search them up. Um, some of these were actually described earlier in RSN. Um, but the high level ones that we should kind of talk about that haven't already been mentioned here are 234's white papers in general. Um, if you search these up on Chief Delphi, they have a lot of really, really cool empirical data that can be used um, for things like belts versus chains for different motors and acceleration um, for, I think they did some on traction limiting and whatnot. Like, so they have a lot of cool empirical data. Some of it's several years old now, but can still be used as kind of the basis of making some decisions. Um, so I think I'm ready for Q and a, if you guys are. Yeah. And, and actually I want to, before we jump into that, I wanted to invite you. I know that you mentioned you, you had some stuff you may want to discuss on that spreadsheet. I think we have some time if you want to go into that and take a look at it a little more closely. Sure thing. Let me pull it back up. Yeah, sure. And like I said, like we've been saying, if you've got questions for Sean, you want to ask, just type exclamation point Q and your question in the chat, and then we'll pull those questions out and uh, ask them live on the air over here. So, alrighty. So I think we got everything uh, up now. So go ahead and uh, take a look. So I wish I actually remembered the exact ratios I had from our 2018 robot so I could show you how we had optimized it there. Uh, this is also a slightly newer version of the spreadsheet. But um, so some of the other graphs on here, there's trade-offs versus motion profiling. Um, you can actually choose to show or hide more distances. Um, so if you're really getting into really cool autonomous stuff, you can look at how long it's decelerating, how long it's cruising between accelerating and decelerating and your autonomous profile, um, depending on different gear ratios. Um, and how, how much of the floor it takes to accelerate. Um, so for instance, this teal line here is the acceleration distance. Um, and say our, our target distance that we said earlier is 18 feet is this purple target distance line um, against the y-axis of distance. You can see with some of these gear ratios, you're not accelerating that long, but for a lot of these, you never actually reach top speed before you hit that. Oh. Um, so that plays into what Jesse calls is over-geared. Um, <laughs> so with this particular gear ratio, um, we wouldn't, we'd be accelerating the whole way up to that 18 feet. We never hit our top speed before we have to decelerate again. Um, so if you're really trying to optimize, you can look at that to say, to create your ideal trapezoidal motion profile of accelerating, cruising, then decelerating. Um, there's also, he does some stuff in here regarding what minimum percentage is required to turn. That's just kind of dashed line here. Um, so you can tell if you're going to trip your main breakers when you're trying to turn. Um, oh, that, that's handy. Yeah, so that, fortunately, it's not as huge an issue as it used to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but like anyone who's been around an FRC for more than 10 years or so remembers the old wheels, of the Skyways and everything else we used to use back in the day before yep. Omni wheels were a thing that we could easily purchase, before lower traction wheels were a thing. Everyone used traction wheels. And 
a lot of teams weren't great at designing drivetrains. Ken Patton has a famous white paper where it's, why won't my drivetrain turn? Um, but yeah, teams would skip or they'd trip breakers trying to turn. So this kind of shows that. I think um, I think my favorite sort of on the fly fix for that was when you'd see a robot come out with four Skyway wheels all at the same level. Tape. Yep, duct tape or zip ties on the wheels. Zip ties, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and as you play with the different ratios here, you can see that, like sure, I could change my motors to adjust these, but I can also play with my wheelbase. How long is my drivetrain? How mm. wide is my drivetrain? And that shows these different aspects are going to update in real time as I make those adjustments. Um, how much my wheel, weight distribution is up front versus at back. Um, and it'll, it'll impact some of this kind of stuff where, where it shows that your drivetrain is really, it's kind of everything that's sitting on the drive of your robot um, can impact all this kind of stuff. You can play with the robot weight as well. If I take my weight down to, say, 80 pounds, it's going to change all these graphs as I'm drawing less current. Um, it's also got, so this is the robot weight, the auxiliary weights, your bumpers and your batteries, or if you had any heavy game row objects. So it's reduce the weight of your bumpers as well because you're building a smaller robot. That'll update there as well. Okay. Or conversely, if I have my full 125 now pound robot, 23 pounds of auxiliary weight, and then I pick up 50 pounds of game objects, suddenly I'm going to have a lot more current problems than I would otherwise. <laughs> Let me raise my current limit tag to kind of show that. Like, we went there versus... 23 pounds there's a little bit less current limiting going on um you can play either static friction and dynamic friction in your wheels static friction is available from a lot of publishers it makes it really easy to find um vir vir virtually every frc vendor is going to list some kind of static friction for their wheels on their website against carpet if you're considering driving it's a different surface you may have to do some experiments dynamic friction i usually don't play with it too much because there's not a whole lot of data on what wheels dynamic frictions actually are they also have the lateral coefficient of friction which is sideways so if I'm going with an omni wheel instead of a traction wheel, I can lower this down to something much lower because I'm not going to have that lateral resistance to turning. That will impact a lot of the turning resistance and stuff in the sheet. So when you're doing that, are you kind of uh, eyeballing where you think the number should be, or are you like running some experiments to kind of get that number? So for the lateral coefficient of friction, yeah. for almost all the wheel, like if I'm using a traction wheel, I almost always leave it the same. Uh -huh. um, the only time I kind of eyeball it is if I'm using like an omni wheel. Um, or occasionally I might fudge it a little bit for certain wheels that I know are easier to turn than they are, or to slide sideways than they are to move forward or back. Like the uh, Vexpro W tread wheels, mm -hmm. um, the four inch wheels are relatively easy to slide sideways, but well, when they're still new, they're going to interlock with the carpet forward and backwards. So I might fudge that number a little bit lower on the, the lateral side. Um, it only now, really affects a couple plots on here, so it's not super important to have specific data on that one. What would you now? Uh, forgive me for kind of throwing this uh, this oddball at you. What would you do if you had, like, for example, a, a robot with rear wheel omnis, like a six wheel drive with rear omnis or front omnis, where you'd have uh, like four tractions and two omnis? Mm -hmm. Would you like lower your? Would you to simulate that? Would you lower your wheelbase or or what would you do? You think? So usually, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna play with my wheelbase to okay. only kind of apply where I expect the forces to be. Um, so if I had like outboard omnis, like I might only list my inboard traction wheels if I'm using like an eight wheel drive or something like that. Okay. Um, but you can kind of play with it to try to mimic as best you can. It doesn't necessarily support mixed wheel configurations, unfortunately. Right. Um, well, but you can still kind of get, you know, within a realm of, of possibility for a lot of the stuff, right? Like your forward to back, uh, numbers and your acceleration would be the same regardless of, of mm -hmm. your traction for wheels, as long as you're not. As long as you're not, uh, you know, doing skids or like, you know, s making the tires yeah, as long chirp. As you're not fishtailing around corners or anything like that. <laughs> yeah. It's... Yes. Oh, um, man. And I used to have a note up here. It might have gotten moved somewhere else where it's like, this is a simulation. If you design all the way up to the leading edge of the simulation, you're just asking yourself for trouble. Yeah. Like, don't assume that you're going to get within 1% accuracy of the real world here. Like, you're going to have some variability that can you're going to have to factor in, like give yourself some margin for error when using this tool or any simulation tool to make yeah. sure that so use it as best you can, but don't, don't expect it to be hundred percent reality. Right. Where, so just, just to make sure everybody uh, knows where would, where can teams find this uh, spreadsheet? So if you go on chief Delphi and search um, for the iLight drive simulator, you should be able to find it. Um, he's has, I think he has a brand new thread for the 2020 version, but you can definitely find the 2019 version as well. Okay. Um, as but, well as if you, if you go to the FRC seventeen twelve YouTube channel, the Dogma YouTube, you can find a YouTube version of this that has a link directly to it as well. Okay, great. And so the um, basically the file stored on Chief Delphi as like a white paper. Yeah. Okay, cool. 
He's also got a GitHub that I think you can find the link to on Chief Delphi. I don't remember his GitHub handle off the top of my head. Yep. Okay, sweet. All right. Well, uh, with that said, I think we're we're gonna take some questions from the chat again. If anybody has any uh, questions, feel free to ask us. Uh, type type exclamation point Q in the chat, and then we'll uh, pick those up and put them uh, up for Sean to talk about. All right. So we've got our first question here coming in. Uh, let me make sure I can put it on screen. There we go. All right. So this question is: um, How much time can you expect to save by optimizing optimizing for sprint distances like this? How many? So like, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, like, is it? Are we, are we talking about uh, a half a second total, or are we talking like, you know, up to a whole new cycle? So it's going to depend on how long the sprint is. Obviously, there's less time to save on a ten foot sprint than there is time to save on a thirty foot sprint. Yeah. Um, but generally, expect only fractions of a second um, to maybe one second. If someone, if you have like a really poorly optimized drive versus a truly optimized drive, you might be talking about a second or a second and a fraction of a second to do a full field sprint. Um, ultimately, your driver practice is going to matter a lot more. On trying, if you want to pack in more cycles, get your robot done earlier, get more driver practice so your driver's cycles are more efficient. Um, but this can help create that edge beyond that. If you're already comfortable building a robot quick enough to get that driver practice, this can save you a little bit more to, give it, to get that edge for you over the other robot. And especially in a game like 2018, where being the first one to the scale really, really mattered. Yeah. This is where optimization, even if it's only a third of a second, can really matter. Well, and and even more so than that, at the very least, I I would say that this is a great way to make sure you don't accidentally put yourself into a negative situation. You know, mm -hmm. you wouldn't want to like like it's like you mentioned in the presentation. It's the classic syndrome of saying my robot's geared to 18 feet per second, and maybe your robot never never gets to 18 feet per second the entire season. Yeah, exactly. Um, the, for, for when we were in FRC as students, like 12 feet per second was considered fast. Yes. These days you see a whole bunch of teams talking about like, oh, I have out this 20 feet per second drivetrain without realizing that they're loading their motors to such a point where they're never going to get anywhere close to 20 feet per second. <laughs> yes, exactly. What You get 20 feet per second if you have a quarter mile to get up to speed. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> Go take it out to the racetrack. Sure, you can get there. <laughs> All right. So our, our next question we're uh, talking about here, uh, they're asking, what are some examples on past games that would make for good uses of a, of a shifting gearbox? Um, so potentially games with full field sprints, you really have the opportunity um, where you may want that high top speed to do that full field sprint, but that sprint speed and that sprint distance aren't traction limited. Um, okay. So that's an example where some teams might go for a two-speed gearbox. Um, granted, it's definitely not mandatory. 610 won the world championship in 2013 doing full field sprints with a single speed drivetrain geared for about 13 feet per second. Um, but there is an opportunity to gain edge doing that, as well as games where you have very different conditions on very different portions of the field where you may need a low gear to survive in this close, tight, densely spacked space around the switch that you may not need in 2018, for instance, that you may not need for driving the length of the field. Um, so it's going to come down a little bit to your robot's strategic priorities. Yep. Um, but generally, full field games are kind of the game where I would look towards maybe using one, um, as well as games where I know I, if I occasionally know I'm going to need like a stump pulling gear, like we go way back in FRC history to 2002, where we have teams picking up things, or 1999, where 190 picked up the puck. Maybe that's an opportunity where I suddenly have a lot more weight. I'm going to need a lot more torque to move my robot. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and to give a little bit of personal thought into that, um, I, in 2017, we used a, a two speed shifter for the first time. Uh, well, we bought one and we used a, a two speed shifter for the first time since like 2002. Um, and that was a, a great application because we would be in low gear if we were doing stuff in one particular area, but then we'd shift into high gear as sort of like a, a boost mode like mm -hmm. ludicrous speed. And we, we would really only live in that gear for, you know, maybe like a couple few seconds, uh, but it would give us extra speed there. We, the next year, 2018, we were like, oh man, what if we have to do those full field sprints again? And we did the shifter uh, all over again. And the same thing happened, like you said, where we have a two speed shifter, but we never ever shift into the second gear. We're always yes. at low speed, you know? And, and, and the other thing, the other <laughs> thought I have is in, in 2006, when I was a student, I was on Team 40 from Manchester, New Hampshire, and uh, we actually had a three-speed gearbox. We had the the older Nothing But DeWalt's gearboxes, mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and so those had Dr. Joe specials. Exactly. Yes. Uh, on our mechanism drive, one on each corner. And so we had three speeds. We had low cruise and then like, you know, a sprint speed. And we would, we would basically only ever use the, um, we would only ever use the main speed, except when we had a sprint button. The driver could push if he needed to jet across the field quickly to shift up. And we had, uh, uh, the low gear, which we had, which was geared so low that it would actually help to keep us in position from a robot that if they were trying to back drive our wheels, if they pushed us sideways, mm-hmm. but yes, for the most part, a three speed gearbox way too much. Don't even think about that unless you have some sort of crazy, crazy, crazy thought you're looking for. So, I mean, a couple other examples just to build off of those like yeah. 2007, um, my senior year in high school, like we, we had a two speed, we stayed in low gear almost all the time. The only exception being when we sprinted across the field to grab tubes off the far wall, but that was such a rare case. It just, it wasn't really worth having that high speed gear Exactly. versus um, more recent uh, examples of teams picking up stuff. If you have a buddy climb, maybe, and you have to position your robot after getting the other robots on you, maybe that's a situation in which you want a low gear mm. um, to move another robot's worth of weight with you. Yep. All right. So uh, kind of going off of that, we have a, another question here. This is a question is for many cot shifters. It seems like that high gear is generally too high, except for these long sort of sprints. Any suggestions on finding more reasonable spreads of speeds? Um, so different vendors have different options. Some of them will give you different options to pick between your high and low gear spreads. Um, so really you got to look around. Um, I know, I, I believe both Andy Mark's, uh, their latest shifter, a Sonic shifter or whatever it is. <laughs> I haven't kept up on the naming convention on their shifters. Yeah. Evo shifter, Evo shifter. Evo, that's, that's what it is, is yep. Um, I know the Evo shifters give you different options to pick your low gear to high gear spread, um, as well as the West Coast products ones. Um, they'll actually let you pick the individual gears you use for. You can pick two gears for low gear and a different two gears for high gear. So by default, you're picking your own spread just based on whatever gears will mesh on the distances assigned. Um, so you can, you can look at those to try to create the spread that works for you for the game challenge. Uh, I know I've had frustrations like that in the past when I built more two-speed gearboxes where it's, I either have a stump pulling gear and a sprint gear, or I have a driving gear and then a ludicrously ludicrously fast sprint gear that I never want to touch. <laughs> yeah. Like, so especially in the older days when there weren't as many cots options, like you, you're really kind of bound to either having a stump pulling gear or uh, like a true true sprint gear. Yeah. All right, I think we're we're coming closer to the end of our our Q and A p- portion here. So we got I think one one more question coming up. Uh, question is. Any advice for newish teams looking to transition out of kit bots? What's the the first type of driveline changes that they should consider? Um, so the first thing you can look at is kind of a kit bot on steroids. Like the kit bot is really, really capable. Yeah. And you can start applying the lessons that I talked about in here to the kit bot. Um, so the very, that's the very first level you can consider um, is just looking at the different gear ratios and the different wheels that are available that will play with the kit bot, play with the tough box. The top box now has three or four different gear ratios that you can pick from. Um, there are a whole bunch of different wheel options you can use. You can use that to be your first kind of baby steps above the kit bot if you want. Um, the next big thing that a lot of teams, including mine, really like are West Coast Drive style things, which are now super supportable via COTS products, um, particularly the VEX Pro products with some of the West Coast products as well. Um, the the VEX Pro um, Versa bearing blocks are really a revolutionary product to make that a truly a thing you can build with hand tools. Oh yeah. Like a drill press is super helpful for making one of these, but you could build it with a cordless drill if you wanted. Yep. Um, so that's kind of the next option for using mostly COTS products to having a, a drive solution that lets you use almost any wheels you want, almost any gearbox uh, ratios you want. Um, and that, that's part of the reason that 1712 goes with the West Coast drive style thing is we can plug the West Coast product single speed gearbox in there, pick whatever gear ratio we want slap any wheels up to like, we can put a 10 inch wheel on there if we wanted. And it would work. <laughs> not that we'd ever do that, but generally yeah. either a four or five or six inch wheel um, of any variety. We can mix and match Omni wheels and traction wheels. Um, we can play with whether or not we want to drop center. Um, and it lets us build our drive train to the game solution while still having a relatively small selection of COTS parts to, to play with that we can order most of those in the preseason and not have to wait on deliveries and build season to start building our drive train. Yeah. All righty. Well, I think uh, that's going to be uh, it for our Q&A portion tonight. Um, Sean, I want to thank you once again for coming in and, and talking about this. It's, it's, I think it's, we've seen a lot of presentations over the years about 
building a drive line and how motors work, but I think taking that and applying it practically for optimization is a, a topic that a lot of people didn't know about. And I'm really eager, and as I say, I'm really happy that you uh, developed this presentation and uh, showed it here for the RSN conferences. Thanks you so much for inviting me. Um, I've given this a couple times in the past, and it's awesome to get this out here in a web-based environment, especially given everything else that's going on in the world right now. Yeah. You can socially distance and still spread knowledge. Exactly, exactly. So uh, for everybody who's watching, thank you for joining us this, this evening. We hope to see you tomorrow for the final day of the RSN Spring Conferences. I'm going to say it's a day jam-packed with certified bangers. We've got lots of really great uh, content coming up. Tomorrow, first thing at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time, we've got Mike Corsetto. He's going to be talking about goal setting in FRC. Following that at 3 p.m., we have a panel with... Uh, five of the Woody Flowers Award winners. We're going to have uh, Andy Baker, Kyle Hughes, Eric Stokely, Freddie Lavardi, and Alan Gregory are all going to be joining us, and they're going to talk a little bit about um, the process that goes through when they when they are the, they are the people that help to select the finalist award winners, and uh, what what teams should be looking for, and the importance of the award in general uh, here in First, especially nowadays. Uh, we've also got uh, Marcus Bernstein. He'll be joining us to talk about how to use Onshape. Uh, with your FRC team, especially right now when everybody's social distancing, like you mentioned, Sean, uh, being able to, to use CAD collaboratively in the cloud, w distributed across a, a vast area is very important for teams. And we're rounding out the day at 6 p.m. with a discussion with the RSN, with a lot of the members of the RSN crew, including uh, Adrian from 148, Tom from 254, Alan will be back on, and Ty from Team 319. They, we're all going to join up and talk a little bit about our thoughts on how this season went from the perspective of not having a bag day anymore. Uh, there's a lot of other things we talk about for the season, but let's, we're going to stick to that part at least. Um, so anyway, Sean, last but not least, thank you so much, Sean, for being here once again. Uh, thank you to everybody who was watching, and we hope to see you guys tomorrow for our final day. But until then, see you, see you later, and uh, have a good one. Really narrow when